So folks, the good news is we're here. Everything's working. The bad news is Miriam couldn't be here today. Now, usually I only show up when Miriam is here. So if you do want to leave because Miriam's not here, I totally won't feel bad. But uh, Miriam couldn't be here today, uh, last minute. So uh, I will cover today. I will be here Friday, but she'll run the Friday session. Uh, and uh, so you'll get your, your full dose of Miriam um, on Friday for Friday's session. So how many of you, I know uh, three or four of you, I see pretty actively in the Blinkit uh, uh, session. Uh, how are people doing with Blinkit? Going through the materials. Okay. I just posted everything except for one video for uh, module three. So for week three. So everything except the very first video is still loading for module three. We had a technical issue, but uh, it's all up except that one it should be up sometime by a couple hours from now. Uh, I would expect it to be up. So everything is up. Uh, Hari, stay afterward if you can for two seconds. We solved your video thing. And now I need to know if it works. And then we will go all in. But we had some issues making it work for you. But we got it. So it's all done. And all the videos are theoretically posted. So we'll check with you as well. OK. Thank you, Matt. You got it. You got it. Turned out YouTube is not as user friendly as one would think. So, all right. So today our focus is on stakeholder management now moving into the needs analysis. So we've identified that we have a problem. Can anyone remember the methodology we shared with you for identifying a, a stakeholder problem? What did we share with you? So ring, ring, Raul. Hi, Raul. I'm Matt. I'm the executive vice president of blah, blah, blah in your company. I need you to come and do a team building workshop for me because my folks desperately need to reconnect after two and a half years of being far away from each other. Can you do a team building workshop for me? And can you do it tomorrow? And I'll only give you 45 minutes. Sure. But tell me what the problem is, first of all. Oh, it's just that they they don't, you know, people just don't know how to talk to each other anymore. Um, I, I think people are, are are really struggling with being back in the same room, breathing the mm. same poisonous air. Mm. Are they getting the results? Well, what do you mean results? You mean, are our clients happy? Absolutely. Our clients love us. Are they performing from your point of view? Well, yeah. I mean, our clients love us. They keep renewing. So we, we don't have any issues. So tell yeah. me, tell me what the problem is from your point of view. Our, 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 I think our people just really need to reconnect. Hmm. But you know, aren't I they think... connecting virtually? Well, I mean, everyone's on Teams, and you know how how awful Teams is. Mm. That's why I prefer Zoom, but our organization won't let us use Zoom. So are they connecting majority virtually, or do they ever get to do face-to-face? -face? Is face-to-face -face the change issue? Well, we're, our, our team is over uh, two continents in five countries. Ah. So it's pretty hard for people to come face-to-face. -face. I mean, heck, ah. it was hard for them to do that before COVID. Mm. So if you were to do a good team building, what would that look like, Matt? Oh, I don't know. Can you, I just want them to have a good time. You a know, good like, time? Like, yeah. Can, can you sure. make sure that they have fun? Yeah. Well, is there, is there like a bouncy castle place close by they can go to? I mean, that could, that could achieve fun. Well, that, <laughs> that could actually an intervention. be kind of cool. That yeah. could be fun. Yeah. Or, you, or they can make virtual pizza together or share, um, you know, cocktail recipes with each other. You might achieve the same outcome. But what do you want them to learn? Well, I, that's where I, I can I help you. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? All right, time out. How's Raul doing? <laughs> hey, let's be, let's be very coarse. And very if it was the real world, I would have just said yes and then I figured <laughs> out the fee. But for the sake of this, <laughs> we had to go through this. <laughs> 
That's awful. Okay, let's assume that we we have this. Hey, Eileen, good to see you. <clears throat> so let's assume that this is the conversation we had, right? Let's assume that this guy calls up Raul for a team building workshop. Let's be coarse. Let's give Raul a grade. How would we evaluate Raul's opening intake conversation? This is intake. How do you do? I think overall, uh, he didn't do too uh, poorly, especially uh, since I think he was put a little bit on, on uh, the spot as well. I think at least uh, some of the things that he uh, uh, was trying to get to is what is it really that you would like to have uh, uh, see as, as sort of like the outcome, right? What is the problem first? What is it really that you're trying to, to, to resolve? And then also starting to deep dive a little bit more into... Well, how do you know actually that your outcome has actually been successful? What is sort of like the the, the, the the eventual thing that you want to see? And how will we sort of identify whether we've met that need? I'm sure right. there's a lot of things where we can go more into detail, but these are already, I think, some some good elements in terms of trying to really get to what is the problem? How will we uh, uh, know whether it's successful? And what type of criteria are we looking for to, to, to show that it's actually been successful? Excellent assessment. By the way, I would give him an A. You know what he didn't do? He didn't even leave the first, what's the problem? Remember our four question categories. We gave you four question categories and Raul brilliantly didn't leave. Let's get to what's your problem. What do you want to have happen as a result of this? When I didn't give him an answer, he didn't give up. He persevered, right? So. Great job on that, Raul. I want some work, by the way, exactly on that. Um, company said, I want a leadership program. And my opening question was, well, what is leadership to you? And they said, fantastic question. And, you know, threw it back to them. And they, you know, we spent the rest of the time figuring out what leadership was before we even identified whether they had a problem or not. And not only that, but if we can avoid even, maybe there is no problem. Maybe yeah. we get to put ourselves out of work, right? Right. So, Don, you're raising an interesting point. He also kept me from shutting down. So there was an interpersonal dynamic, uh, a, a competency around the interpersonal piece. He didn't say, hey, Carrie, you're an idiot. I can't believe you, you, you're asking me to do some flaky team building workshop uh, at, at the expense of productivity time and so forth without any uh, legitimate objective. He didn't make me feel dumb or he didn't put me down. He didn't attack me, right? So we played the politics of it as well. But the key thing I want you to walk away with here is Raul didn't leave that problem piece, right? If and only if we identify the problem, do we then get to look at, well, what would the criteria of success be for that? No, we haven't even started to think about solutions. We're still just trying to clarify what is the issue. And that's the review from last week. Our objective is to really dive deeply to fully understand not only what are his expectations, but what is the issue we're trying to resolve? What is the problem? Do we even have a problem? Should we even engage? Otherwise, we're simply order takers. And an order taker is never going to get called in for more strategic problem solving. Anyone, everyone good with that? Any, everyone buy that? I find okay. Apple, Apple do the same strategy, you know, um, quite often. Rather than you just coming in with, I want this, they'll ask you why, you know, what's the background behind there and try to avoid, you know, sometimes they talk you out of it because for them, it's a long term relationship that's more important than the short term. You know, cash flow. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. So intake, our first two weeks of this program have really been around defining the problem. Today, week three now, we've identified the problem. Now we need to start doing a needs analysis to ascertain what are the root causes, which then lead to an identification of the performance gap, which lead to us identifying what the learning solution might be, or it's not a learning solution, correct? Okay, so 
who's got a problem in their organization like Peter? <laughs> Anytime now, Peter. Well, I mean, I think that uh, there's, there's, I think, a multitude of uh, problems that we have in our organization. One of them uh, that uh, we are uh, facing uh, quite often right now is there's uh, a lot of talk around, um, at least in, in, in the commercial world, around going to uh, consultative selling. And uh, we have uh, quite a lot of stakeholders said, I want my people to know how to do consultative sales. Um, and one of the issues we have there is, well, firstly, getting them to identify what is it actually that you're looking for. So what is the outcome that you're looking for? Again, I think the same thing as uh, what we've been uh, going through uh, uh, quite a lot already is people just saying, I want to course on this or I want to course on that. Um, and then it's also uh, about how do we make sure that we convince them that what we are doing uh, with this needs analysis is just as important. Uh, and then also designing the course itself, what is actually the outcomes that you uh, want to see and how do we measure those outcomes? What are actually the criteria that will show you that now we've actually moved the needle on this? All right. I love this. This is a great playground for us to, to play in. So let's first back up. We've identified, or at least our stakeholders have identified consultative selling as a solution. But do we know what the problem is yet? Peter may, but we don't yet, do we? So are we seeing a decrease in number of sales? Are we seeing an increase in number of sales, but a decrease in the margin? Are we seeing a lack of renewals in the sales? year to year, what is our problem in, in, in the sales methodology right now? Why do we identify that our folks need consultative selling? Peter, put on your stakeholder client hat. Yes, uh, so one of the uh, reasons why we're seeing this is because we've actually uh, changed from uh, the amount of products that we sell to some very, from some very commoditized products to much more uh, complex uh, integrated products as well, which to us uh, uh, sort of shows that we need to have a different approach to uh, how we uh, put these uh, products in the market. It requires a lot more of understanding your customer before you can actually identify the right complex product to sell to them, as opposed to what we had when we were selling more commoditized products. Got it. Okay. So, hey, folks, that's not a that's a pretty black and white problem. Is it a legitimate problem? Can we measure that problem as existing? Uh, we should actually be able to measure it because we know the amount of sales of these uh, new products that we have, uh, and we are not seeing them go up in line with uh, our expectations or how fast we would like to see the increase in sales go up. Okay, so we know that we're not seeing the number of sales and the quality of the sale going up at the rate we're forecasting. So we know we have this as a problem, right? So that's ground zero. Now, what do we need to evaluate? Now we need to go into a root cause analysis. So what do we want to know from Peter? Yeah, can I, Matt, before we go into the root cause analysis, can I just ask a question? Um, if, if this conversation would, were to have gone a slightly different way and they'd say, our sales are fine and we believe that doing consultative selling will help us do better. Like, not that we're not meeting our goals, but we think we could do better. So would that be an okay thing? Like, well, let's give it a shot and see, or how would you go about if that was their problem? What do you all think? It ain't broken. Should we change it ain't how broke, people are don't doing fix it? it. <laughs> Who said well, that? Maybe upskilling. What new skills do they need to apply this new selling technique? Okay, but doesn't that worry you? A little bit. If I upskill people away potentially from doing what they're doing today well, maybe that's good because maybe we're going to see a transition over the next year or two years and we're being preemptive, we're being strategic, right? So I'm good with that. But what happens if what we're teaching actually undermines what they're doing well today? How do we know? So, we Julie, what are the... yeah, go ahead. Whoever said that? Yeah, we do a pilot. And it doesn't have to be everyone. We could. What anyone uh, who knows Talheimer knows his favorite phrase in life is A B testing. 
So we could absolutely do an A-B test, right? So that's an interesting thing, but are we there yet? Have we done enough to determine whether consultative selling is the approach to go? It is the real issue. Um, you're changing people who um, don't want to do this uh, because it takes longer and their incentives aren't tied to it. So this could be actually a change issue, not just selling them consultative selling. And the other thing is you'd want to know whether or not they're being incentivized to sell this because if they're not, it doesn't matter what we do, you're still not going to get the results. Ah, so we may actually have a non-training problem. Maybe people have no problem selling consultatively. It's just that they're sold to sell transactively. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. So we still, this is why, Julie, no matter what happens, we have to go to root cause analysis because we have to see what is actually the real problem here. We know that the problem is we're transitioning to more strategic product placement. We get that. But why is this a problem today? Is it a policy problem? Is it a procedural problem? Is it an incentive or motivational problem? We haven't even started to look at, is it a knowledge, skill, ability, or, added, uh, or uh, ability problem, right? So we first need to do an analysis to fully understand where this problem exists. Does that make sense? So let me just pull up. How many of you know who Thomas Gilbert is? Are you familiar with Tom Gilbert? If you're not familiar, he is one of the greats in all of history around performance consulting. Uh, big ISPI, International Society for Performance Improvement guy. If you know Guy Wallace, you you probably have heard of Tom Gilbert and, and his acolytes. Tom Gilbert came up with a thing called six boxes. And I've consolidated it to four because I can never remember more than four things. So we're giving you a four box version of it. Yes, yes, great, Shelly. This is one of the best analytic tools for us to start driving toward understanding root cause. Now, how does this work? Let me share it with you. My gosh, I've been in teams so much lately. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I just went to the wrong button. Okay, here is a derivative of Gilbert's six boxes. The first box that I'd like you to think about is what Gilbert talked about around communication. In other words, do people have the knowledge needed to be able to get done what they need to get done? So when we're talking about consultative sales, do the folks know what the policies are around our new shift in product, how we're approaching things? What types of procedures are we putting in play from an account management standpoint, from uh, we need to have procedures on how people are getting paid. It might be a pricing situation. Do we have procedures on how to set price, et cetera? What are the guiding principles for how we want to approach selling both consultatively, but also if we're thinking about this product shift becoming more strategic? What are the guidelines? In other words, what are the parameters, the playground that people are able to play in? Expectations, goals, et cetera, and blah, blah, blah. blah. There's a whole list of communication type pieces of information that these salespeople need to have to be able to make good decisions, to be able to execute and make happen. If we don't have this in play, then you can't focus on the person individually from a knowledge skill perspective to begin with. We need to make sure that this communication box is fulfilled in advance. Then I go to the other boundary and we look at the environment. Do we have in play coaching, managerial, leadership support to ensure that this process is embraced? Can people come into our office and ask us questions? 
Do we have the technical resources? Uh, if you're using Salesforce, are those tools available, working? Do we have the proper apps on our phones? Uh, do we have other equipment databases? Heck, do we have the budget to be able to do the kind of investment we need on this? Do we have the right people to help support this across the firm and so forth? So do we have the tools and the resources and do people know what they need to understand about the new structure? This is all permission to play. Knowledge and environment are permission to play. Key, fundamental, foundational bits that we have to focus on. I start with those two boxes when I'm looking at whether uh, our problem is truly an issue and where the gaps are within that problem. Question before I go into training and motivation? The next one I like to look at is the motivation box. So in other words, do we have an attitudinal problem? Do we have a motivational gap? Why? Because if I politically incorrectly metaphorically, not really, put a gun to their head, could they do consultative selling? If the answer is yes, and they're still not doing it, then the problem is attitudinal, it's motivational. And we need to solve that problem, which is not a learning problem, it's a policy procedure managerial problem. So we look at the different factors that affect attitude and motivation next. And now, and only now, do we go into the knowledge and skill box? And we look to make sure we have in the environment the right tools and support for people to learn, whether it's training, job aids, uh, in the, you know, Bob Mosier and Conrad Godfordson talk about in the workflow support, performance support. So manuals, are we providing on the job support, mentoring, debriefing? By the way, I, I leave coaching out of this because. Coaching can be supportive of all four boxes, right? So this derivative of Gilbert is my go-to tool when I start doing analysis. Let me stop here. By the way, this is in Blinkit already, and there's a, two videos on it, as well as the, the slides will be up there when we're done. Questions on the, the four boxes on analysis? Uh, Matt, any any reason why you left these boxes in a not ordered way following the sequence of your approach to them, or is it? Uh, probably not, because I think if, uh, if we took to Guy, he might come up with a different way of ordering it, or Will might have a different way of ordering it. This is the way my brain works, and, and I, I stole it from Gilbert, obviously, and... Uh, so he actually had three on top, three on the bottom, three were external, three were focused on the individual. And so it just got more complex. I have no good reason. So, but I, I probably have a question make around one because I think, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, I have a question around this as well. And I think, uh, I think it's a really good model, right? And it helps to sort of uh, um, drill down firstly on other uh, factors before you actually go into the training, which I think is already uh, something that as an L&D professional, we need to work, I think, much better with our stakeholders to see these things as well. What do you do if a stakeholder, for instance, doesn't have influence on some of these things? Well, it depends because then is, it, is the stakeholder... Uh, there's a difference in a stakeholder being an influencer, a stakeholder being the decision maker, a stakeholder being the money provider. For example, some of the stakeholders I deal with, they have absolutely nothing but the purse strings. They just stop the money. They're in finance or they're IT. And for whatever reason, IT gets to make any decision they want. And so they have no decision-making power other than to shut a project down. Alternatively, it could be the CEO who can make these decisions. So you A, have to determine whom your stakeholder is and make sure you're talking at that right level. Um, if this doesn't exist, then I make a large case for why we need to start with ensuring the proper documentation is there especially if we're looking to go toward consultative selling. 
how do I transition to consultative selling in the absence of having the commission structure reflect it, in the absence of having uh, account managers supporting it and driving it across different accounts, blah, blah, blah. So you cannot transition to consultative selling without having the structure in place. And by the way, some stakeholders will say, hey, imaging, can't we just do the training first and we'll, we'll build the rest of it concurrently? Because people need to be ready coming out of the gate. And of course, that fails every time. And what yeah, kind of I think that's a, it's a good example also, right? Uh, because um, just to, to sort of build upon that, we, we live in a, or at least uh, me and my team live in a corporate environment, right? And sometimes you have stakeholders that come to you and they might only have influence over a certain part of it. Let's say they are an, uh, a country sales manager or something like that, and they want to have certain training, but they don't have influence, for instance, over the incentives. The incentives are done uh, all the way up in the center corporate level. Right. So those country uh, uh, sales managers don't have any influence over it, but they are still measured on getting it done. So that is where sometimes some of this, uh, these difficulties come in, uh, um, and then it becomes sort of uh, our task as a team also to see, do we then have access to those stakeholders or not? Because sometimes we don't even have access to these stakeholders either. And that's when it starts to become complex. How do you then deal with that? And how can you convince yeah. this area or country sales manager that, yeah, the risk needs to be in place, but he or she has no access to the corporate environment or might not even want to talk to these stakeholders to say, hey, this is where my problem lies. Well, and it gets worse, right? Because your, your country, your regions, they'll be paid differently than global sales. And if they're paid differently, there's no way the regional head is going to even talk to you because they're going to just do however they're paid. And so you're out of luck. And so you have to push back and have a different conversation. By the way, we're going to get into those kinds of conversations when we get into the messy stuff. Right now, we're just reviewing the different processes, but then it gets messy because you can do everything right. And you're going to have some chief commercial officer who's going to get in your face and say, yeah, I, I see where you're going with this, but I just don't want to. And they're going to insist on doing it their own way. And that becomes a different political problem. And so we'll definitely get into some of those examples, but I want to focus first on the processes, and then we can get into some of the political quagmires that will arise. And I, I have to warn you, you're going to lose way more than you win. It's just unfortunately so. Keith Grint uh, is an historian in the, uh, business in the UK out of Oxford. And Keith is one of my heroes. Uh, he did a whole bunch of longitudinal studies along with some of his colleagues. And what they found was that uh, if you look at organizations, they start with an intervention in year zero. And the leadership team will execute for a year or two, and then they go bye-bye. And the new leadership team comes in and, oh no, we have a way better approach. So everything that was going on is gone. All the new processes come in. Well, a few years go by, they're gone. Now the new leadership, and this cycles through for 15, 20 years. By the time you hit the fourth or fifth group, guess what system is back in play? Right back to the square one where they started in year zero. And they have about 60 or 70 organizations in Europe that show this 15 to 20 year cycle of just cycling through the same stuff over and over again it, it's incredible i think that's something that 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 we we definitely also see in the, some of the corporate environments and it's a bit of this pendulum swing also right yeah. for instance the centralization and decentralization everybody wants to decentralize and by the time that you get there everybody wants to centralize again so right. it's yep and and people like us are just sitting there saying oh my gosh what are we doing but let's have a big fancy uh, meeting to discuss it at a Mandarin Orange in some fancy beach town as we look at cutting costs, right? So yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's that approach. All right, now we've done that 
and it is a skill problem. It is a knowledge and skill gap. You with me? Now we want to look at the person because maybe it's still not a knowledge and skill gap. Maybe we're not there, but we need to validate it. So can I get everyone, does everyone know what knowledge, skills, abilities, and attitudes are? What's the difference between a skill and an ability? Ability is ingrained versus a skill can be acquired. Yeah, skills can be learned. You get better. I can uh, learn a new skill and get super mastery at it. Um, but an ability is innate. It's talent. And there's only a finite amount of growth I can get in, in talent. For example, this is as good looking as I'm ever going to get. It's just not going to get any better than this. Right? That, that's in, that's I was born this way. There's nothing, I, no improvement. There's no practice that's going to make that happen. Charisma is another ability, right? The famous uh, U.S. story is Al Gore. Uh, if you, I don't know if you're all familiar. Al Gore was the vice president of the United States from 1993 to 2001. Uh, good guy, ran for president in 2000. And... Uh, realized he had a charisma problem. So he went out and hired a coach to teach him how to be more charismatic. How do you think that went? Well, if you're familiar with American history, there was a whole Macarena incident uh, where he danced the Macarena and uh, there was a charisma problem. And the charisma problem could not be rectified because charisma is an ability. And he could only get better so far. Now, there are things that we can do. It's not as clean cut. Abilities are often influenced by other factors. And so we can often create mitigation factors around that. But we have knowledge, we have abilities, we have skills, and we have attitudes. But how do we determine which is which in the moment when we're trying to figure out what to do? And why do I ask that? What's the intervention for knowledge? If it's a knowledge gap, what do we do? Do we do large scale training if it's a knowledge gap? They don't understand the policy. What do we do? Make sure policies and procedures are there and accessible. You give it to them, talk about them, but it's not a training problem. It's, it's an accessibility problem, right? Yeah, exactly, Claire. They have to have the support documentation. What if it's a skill gap? What do we do? We need to know how deep that gap is or broad yep. and then act accordingly. And then you do training and provide practice opportunities with feedback loops, right? So that's where training and learning come in when there's a skill gap. What about an ability gap? What do we do? Fire them. <laughs> I mean, if the ability is a necessity, then you have to rethink your workforce. <laughs> yeah, you 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 allocate them to a different role, yeah. change the role definition, or you find mitigations to support the ability gap. Right, but it's not a training problem, is it? Attitudinal problem. What do you do? Yell at them. <laughs> that always absolutely right. It always worked with me. Uh, you, you, if it's an attitudinal problem, this is where coaching or mentoring might come in. But if it's a severe problem, right? Sometimes there's a traumatic uh, issue at hand. There's personal problems. It might be that EAP, the Employee Assistance Program that most organizations have. You align them and they can get help. Therapy, it, right? It's also potentially, I, I mean, as a often the case with requests, it might be a leadership gap where they're not, you know, you've got leaders who aren't just effective at communicating the purpose, right? Or but a sense they, of, of purpose, right? It could be, maybe my lead, maybe the attitude problem is environmental, but regardless, we don't find out till we start having conversations with them, right? And has the attitude program always been there or is it something new that yeah. changes everything? Exactly, exactly. Maybe Rich is being a jerk today because of something that just happened in the organization. It's not because he's a jerk. 
something is is tweaking them and this is now it, it's a rick problem a, a rich problem but it's not really a rich problem we have to do that root cause right analysis but we got to be able to figure out pretty quickly what <laughs> that's good rich we got to be able to figure out what it is that's the gap so our two boxes we weeded them out it's no longer a communication problem and it's not an external resource problem so now we got to determine is it a knowledge skill ability or an attitudinal problem here's the metaphor i like to use can i get all of you to put your hands out like this all right thumbs down left over right now weave your fingers together and clasp them together good now bring them underneath like this take your two index fingers touch them to your nose the knuckles your knuckles kind of like that by the way there's a video on this in, in the course take your two knuckles now strain the fingers so they're surrounding your nose you got you're getting there mary and release and wave who got it who's able to do it well marion do you mind helping me out can we do a performance analysis with you all right so we take marion we're going to spotlight her for everybody all right marion let's try it one more time but before we do i'm going to offer you 1000 canadian dollars is that still good Okay. Are you willing to try and do this for a thousand Canadian dollars? You get the money if you're able to do this. Okay. All right. Are you motivated by that? I'm motivated. I think you're going to have to walk me through the, the steps again. We'll do it one more time together. Okay. But right now, folks, do you think that we have a motivational or attitudinal problem with marrying? At our most superficial level, of course. Do we have an, an attitudinal problem? Is she a willing player? Yeah, we don't. But let's try it. Let's see. Because if we offer her the money and then she still fails, what's <laughs> going to happen to her motivation? Right? So we will have a motivational problem. But right now we don't. Let's give it a shot, though. Hands out. Thumbs down. Left over right. Weave them together, clasp them, come underneath, two index fingers to your nose, strain them, and release. Oh, no. Phew, I don't have to give up the money because I don't actually have any. So good, good. All right, so we don't have a motivational problem. Now, from an ability standpoint, there are three types of abilities this requires. One, you have to have the basic intelligence to be able to do this. I've known you for a while. You are one of the smartest people I know. There's no intelligence gap here. Okay, secondly, you have to have physical abilities. You have to have a nose, two hands, you have to be flexible, and five fingers on each hand. Posable thumbs help too. You meet all those requirements, right? Emotionally, you have to have the ability to persevere, to engage. Does she? I think so. Do we have an ability gap? Put it in the chat. No. Claire says you're good to go. Now, from a skill perspective, hey, I've shown you how to do this multiple times now. What is required? She needs to practice, right? Go ahead, practice. Let's see if you can get it. Uh, but if you keep practicing, what's going to happen? Motivation. Right? So we have the risk here of screwing with her motivational capacity to do this, right? But right now, will our performance gap close through any more training, feedback, and uh, practice? Probably not yet. 
we might have to come back to practice and feedback. But right now, if left on her own, she's not going to get any better. But are we sure we've given her all the proper information? Is it possible I left out a key piece of information? Marion, let's try one more time, okay? Hands out. Watch her motivation. This is a stupid training trick. Can you see her motivation in this going? Right? So just think of it mattered. All right, hands out. Thumbs down. Left over right, but do me a favor. Make sure it's your left pinky that's on top. Your left pinky should go on top first. How's that feel? Does that feel different? Now, when you come underneath, take your two knuckles. There you go. Now, just really, yep, straighten your knuckles. Now, let go. Huh. Now, I got to do, yeah, just lift your hand over. Yeah, you were almost there. What do we have now to do? What bit of information didn't I give her? I have no idea what I'm doing wrong. But right. I'm at this point, it's like, okay, you can, I need, to, yeah. At this point, my motivation is going, I couldn't care less. <laughs> right. So, but is we needed to give her one, information. I, I, I'm wondering, what is the point of the exercise? Yeah. Yeah. We, so I think, it, yeah. So I feel like I'm crossing something. And it's like, it doesn't. Yeah. It's not working yet. Right. <laughs> so we need to combine the knowledge piece. Because do you guys, did you pick up on what information I hadn't given first? What, what was left out? The left pinky, right? Now it becomes training. Now we have to coach her, provide her with feedback, make sure that she's learning it. But what was missing first? That piece of knowledge was missing first. Whose fault is this? My, I'm an idiot designer. We didn't design this intervention properly, right? And what's the risk of a bad design? How's Marion feeling? Right? It, she's, her motivation started up here. And as I failed to design properly, as I failed to identify the knowledge requirements properly, then have good design around the training and the practice and provide good motivational supports. I ruined her, at least for this activity, right? So bad design, bad analysis, and bad communication can destroy a participant's willingness to even play anymore. So we can start well and crash and burn if we don't do this properly. Does that make sense? So this activity, I find it very helpful to think through, do we have all the information in play? And if we wait till the end, we are going to ruin her training. We're going to ruin her motivation. And we're not going to be able to leverage the environmental supports properly. So we have to start with that communication box. We have to make sure we have that right procedure first. If we're backtracking and backfilling that communication box and wait till the end, it's too late. The other three boxes, you can go in any order because it'll depend more on the person. But if you don't start with having all that information, Peter, to your point, up front, you're going to have a massive organizational problem. That's the business case to your question earlier. So, Marion, will you forgive me? Good of you. All right, Peter, does that help answer the business problem of not having all the your ducks lined up properly no no absolutely absolutely and then i think that that's uh that's one of the things that that we 
face uh, I think quite often uh, I think like I said uh, the the more difficult part is usually the organizational politics that come around it right uh, um, because we might know and we might be able to convey that message but that doesn't mean that the stakeholder the person who's asking for it uh, then suddenly says oh no I'm going to approach this differently or I am going to to, to to make any changes and sometimes they just can't right so it's a I, I think it illustrates things quite well, um, but it's also about getting your stakeholder to see it and then getting them to take a certain action around it as well. Right, right, exactly, exactly. We have to have that communication box lined up first because we can destroy individual students, we can destroy the methodology, we can teach and embed into the organization bad practices. There are so many ways in which we can ruin everything we're spending tons of money on to make happen. Now, one last thing, a little bit more context setting. So when you're thinking about this, we get a problem or a stakeholder calls us in and says, I want X. You go through all your intake your, and you determine that, yep, the stakeholder is right, or actually the stakeholder really needs management development or some overall topic, right? You resolve on your topic. Now we need to start identifying what we need to teach, not just the gaps, but overall what needs to be developed and prepared. And that's what Miriam and Paul and many other researchers like John Sweller and Rich Mayer all talk about as complex skills. Each of those complex skills has simple applications, tasks embedded within those. For example, our general topic might be management. Within that, the complex skill would be performance management. Performance management would be the evaluation, measurement, development of team members over time, right? So goal setting, performance appraisals, all of those collectively equal performance management. One task within that is feedback delivery. So how do I deliver feedback? So Management development, within that one complex skill with, is performance management. By the way, there are many other complex skills associated, resource allocation, uh, planning, um, managerial conversation, blah, blah, blah. We can go in any different way. Managing motivation, right? Performance management is just one. And then feedback delivery would be one task within performance management. If we break that down into our boxes, using knowledge, skills, abilities, and attitudes and external factors, right? So here are just some of the examples of what those might be. And here's a hierarchy. So just again, breaking it down further. So performance management's one, feedback delivery, goal setting, career conversations. These are tier level two sets of tasks. We've already talked about knowledge, skills, and abilities. Now, if we are going to break out feedback, what are the different pieces of knowledge associated with delivering feedback? Well, there has to be a feedback process. Uh, nowadays, a lot of us are talking about feed forward. So feed forward process, what is that? What are the policies that the company has toward employee development? Why? Because feedback's associated with development. What are the skills? Well, having the conversation, figuring out what feedback or feed forward to give is a skill. Abilities, empathy would be an ability. You probably don't want any sociopaths as a manager. What are some of the attitudes we want? And so forth, okay? So, I'll put, this is gonna be one of the things that we'll post that, that's uploading, but I just wanted to line this up because your homework for Friday is this. Uh, let me just make sure I'm getting it pulled up. So your homework 
for Friday will be this. All right. So we're in week three. Here's your week three homework. So I want everyone in the program to identify that complex learning opportunity. So Peter, it might be that it's consultative sales, but what's the problem that is driving us toward consultative sales as the solution? And if our topic is consultative sales, then we're gonna go through and drive in that context, okay? So elevating the conversation up, Peter, What's the problem you've identified? Well, we're transitioning our product lines. Why is this a problem? Because our products now are much more complex and require a needs-based approach. How do you know this to be so? What's the root cause? What's the evidence to support this? What solutions now? Well, we want to teach people consultative selling skills. Okay, well, why do you think this is going to solve the problem? How will you measure this as having solved the problem or at least being a part of the solution? What are some of the key dependencies? If you don't solve it, 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 what do you need in the organization to enable you to make this happen? Well, it might mean going into that communication box and making sure that certain things are in place before you do any of this. And then how are you a key dependency for others? And what don't you know that you want to know? What we'd like is for you to upload a selfie video. So just use your phone and upload answering these questions. Tell a story. It doesn't have to be good. No one's going to see these except all of us. We're not sharing these outside of the course. So upload it. And then I'd like you to watch two of your peers' videos and just comment on it. Ask some questions. Just comment on other people's issues, problems, thoughts, and solutions on it. And if you could do this before Friday session, that'll give us the ability to drive that into our needs and task analysis conversation for that. Okay? Questions on the homework? By the way, you, what happens if you don't do the homework? have to do that finger exercise again in front of everybody. Not Marion. We've tortured <laughs> Marion enough. We wouldn't do that. Nothing happens. This is a, a intrinsic motivation or extrinsically peer pressure. So whichever works for you, I don't, ultimately it won't matter, but uh, we want you to do it because it's a way for us to help drive the course back into your workflow. So that's why we're asking you to do it. Okay. Does this I work? It's not an relevant? internal one. What's that, Rich? You framed it as like within your organiz own organization. Um, maybe well, I can for you, it could be a client. For you, it okay. could be a client. Yeah. I'll summarize a client issue. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Carrie, I think for you as well, I think you're dealing more client facing. Is that correct? No, I'm wrong. Never mind. So, all right. How are we doing? I've got, is this still I've got going a past okay? one I would like to do. Hmm? Can I do one, an issue that I encountered in the past that I've always been curious yeah. about bringing? Okay, awesome. Do anything that helps you. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. All right, folks, I'm going to stop the recording. Bye.